Hello, we'll be discussing your auditory alterations. So problems with our ear. To start, let's talk about the anatomy and physiology. So when I talk about the basic concepts in the ear, it would be wise for us to remember that the ear is divided into three. You have your outer ear, your middle ear, and then your inner ear. Before that, let's talk about the basic functions of our ear. Our ear has two basic functions. One is hearing and the second one is balance and equilibrium. When I talk about hearing, other than your ability to hear, this would be also in charge on our speech and ability to communicate with others. So remember, a child would have a hearing difficulty or a child that would have a hearing difficulty would have problems on talking and would have problems also on their ability to communicate with others. They are unable to talk because they are unable to know sounds. Next, balance and equilibrium. So other than our cerebellum, okay, your balance and equilibrium is also taken care of by your ears. Okay, so the inner ear specifically would be in charge on the body movement, the position, and coordination. Hence, if your patient's cerebellum is intact but your patient is still having problems with balance and equilibrium, you would suspect an inner ear problem. Now, when I talk about hearing, okay, it is your ear that provides a pathway for auditory stimuli to reach the brain. There are two possible pathways for these auditory stimuli to reach our brain. Okay, we have the two types of conduction. You have your air conduction and then your bone conduction. Okay, take note of this, air conduction and bone conduction. Whereas for your balance and equilibrium, okay, there needs to be coordination between three systems. One, the muscle and joints of your body, referred to as your proprioceptive system. Then, of course, your eyes, your visual system, and then your labyrinth or your vestibular system. So, when I talk about your vestibular system, we are referring to the structures of your inner ear. Okay? Labyrinth. Labyrinth is part of your inner ear also. Now, let's talk about your outer ear. Class, your outer ear would start from your auricle going towards your tympanic membrane. This is where your external auditory canal, oftentimes that we refer to as your EAC, could be found. So this is about 2 to 3 centimeters long. If you would look at less the auricle, okay, the ear that we see from the outside, so your auricle is actually collecting sound waves and vibrations. Okay, the structure of your auricle is in such way that once the sound would be entering towards your inner ear, middle ear and inner ear, the sound will become magnified. Okay? That the same structure also allows to capture the sound waves that is near us. Added to that, so you can notice that uh, this will be the end of your external ear already. So that is your tympanic membrane. Okay, so class, your tympanic membrane is the demarcation line between your outer ear and then your middle ear. Now, this is your eustachian tube. Your eustachian tube is actually already part of your middle ear. But just for the purpose of discussion, we need to know that your eustachian tube is the one that connects the ear to the nasopharynx. So, your eustachian tube would be open when you are doing valsalva maneuver, when we are yawning, or when we swallow. It has a twofold purpose. Okay, so you have drainage and pressure maintenance. Plus, this is actually the reason why when, we're, when we are having your plane rides, especially when the plane is about to take off, we are advised that you need to swallow. Okay, class, the swallowing there is intended to balance the pressure within our ear. Once, class, the plane is elevates from the ground, the tendency is that there will be an increase in the atmospheric pressure. Okay, this increase in pressure would also increase the pressure inside our ear. So with that, you are advised to swallow because swallowing would help relieve the pressure by releasing some of it going towards your nasopharynx. Okay, so as I have mentioned earlier, the structure of your outer ear allows for 22 times magnification by the time that the sound would be reaching your inner ear. Now, this is the structure of your auricle. Class, your auricle is also known as your pina. Take note of that. So please take note of the structure of your tragus. So your tragus could be found here. Opposite to that is your anti-tragus. Then class, you also have your anti-helix. Okay, so take note of these structures. Then you have your helix. As I have mentioned earlier, this structure allows for amplification of sounds. Okay, the curvatures there would allow for amplification of sounds. If you will encounter patients with structural deformity in the ear here, you would usually encounter patients also who are unable to discern different levels of sounds. 
this is the structure of your middle ear. So when I talk about the middle ear, your middle ear would be coming from your tympanic membrane going towards your staves or the end of your staves. Now class, tympanic membrane is a crucial part of our ear. So when I talk about your tympanic membrane, these are the anatomical landmarks of your tympanic membrane. So when I talk about anatomical landmarks, this should be clearly seen when we are doing your otoscopic examination using your otoscope. Okay? Now, you have your pars flaccida and then you have your pars tensa. So to differentiate between pars tensa and pars flaccida, remember this. Your pars tensa would compose almost 80% of your tympanic membrane. So your pars tensa would contain all the three layers. So the three layers are your outer, your fibrous, and your inner mucosal layer. Your pars flaccida, on the other hand, would only contain two layers. It lacks the fibrous layer. It would only contain the outer and the inner mucosal layer. For that reason, okay, it is vulnerable to pathologic diseases. Now, notice these protrusions here. Class, this protrusion should be normally seen when you are doing your otoscopic examination. If these protrusions are not present on your otoscopic examination, you would suspect that there is already bulging of your tympanic membrane. When there is bulging of your tympanic membrane, you would suspect that there is increased pressure inside the tympanic membrane. And that increase in the pressure inside the tympanic membrane may be brought about by, okay, one, it could be fluids, two, it could be exudates, or three, simply bulging due to increased pressure due to the increase of your atmospheric pressure. Okay? Your light reflex here is actually the light that is uh, being used from your otoscope. Okay? So you would expect that your light reflex will be present there to indicate that your uh, tympanic membrane is translucent. Okay? So your manubrium here, then your mammalius, so these are parts of your ossicles. So when I talk about ossicles, remember that your ossicles are the smallest bones in our body. So you have your malleus, your incus, and your staves. Class, the function of your malleus, incus, and staves is to vibrate one another to transmit sound from the tympanic membrane going towards your inner ear. Okay? Now, if there will be a problem such as autosclerosis, when I say autosclerosis, there is hardening of this malleus, incus, and staves. Once there is hardening of the malleus, incus, and staves, there will be problem with sound transmission from your outer ear, tympanic membrane, going towards your inner ear. So later on, we'll talk about the condition autosclerosis. So, the role of your outer and your middle ear class is to conduct and amplify sound waves. Okay, it's to conduct and amplify sound waves. In other words, it does your air conduction. So your problem with outer and middle ear would lead to what we call your conductive hearing loss. There are two kinds. Actually, there are three kinds, I mean, of hearing loss. One is your conductive hearing loss. The other one is sensory neural hearing loss. And then the third one is the mixed type. Take note that when there are problems on the outer and middle ear, your patient would have conductive hearing loss. Again, there will be conductive hearing loss. Next. We'll talk about the structures of your inner ear. So if we're viewing the ear like this, okay, in this view, class, this is the part of your inner ear. So recall that there are your semicircular canals, you would have your bony labyrinth, you have your cochlea, you have your ampulla, otricle, and saccule, you have your organ of corti, and then you have your cochlear duct. Then you have your oval window, and then your round window, and then the membranous labyrinth. Okay, so take note, it's the labyrinth there. So class, in your inner ear, this is already your temporal bone. This reminds us that your inner ear is already protected and behind your temporal bone. So it's protected. Class, you have these terms. Your semicircular canals are considered to be your organ of balance, whereas your cochlea is considered to be your organ of hearing. Why is your semicircular canal referred to as your organ of balance? Because it is the one that would be able to detect whether there is movement in our body. It is the one that would help us determine whether we are lying down, whether we are standing, whether we are sitting, whether, whether we are supine position. Okay, so that's your organ of balance, your semicircular canals. And then your organ of hearing, which we, would, we, which we would commonly say as ears when we are elementary students. So right now, we'll upgrade it to be your cochlea. So your sound waves are processed through your cochlea. Okay, so look at this. 
it is from your inner ear where the facial nerve and then your cranial nerve number 8 would be coming from. Notice or recall that our main nerve here is your cranial nerve number 8, okay, which is our acoustic nerve, also referred to as your vestibulocochlear nerve. So class, it's referred to as vestibulocochlear nerve because it would be in charge with the vestibule and then the cochlea. Okay, so you have here the cochlear branch and then you have the vestibular branch. Okay, notice that your facial nerve also has a part on your um, ear, which would mean, class, that any problem on the facial nerve could also cause pain, okay, or could also be elicited as pain in your ear, okay, or any inflammation, class, on your ear could be manifesting also as an inflammation or pain on other parts of the face. So again, that's your cranial nerve number seven and cranial nerve number eight. So class, in your semicircular canals, it is your superior, posterior, and lateral canals that would detect our rotational movement. Whereas it is your ampulla, your utricle, and then your saccule that would detect the linear movement. And then class, it is in your cochlea where the mechanical energy, which is our sound energy, is transformed to your neural activity. And this neural activity class is the one that will be transmitted from your ear going towards your cranial nerve number 8 going towards our brain. The particularly that will be your temporal lobe of the brain. So how is it possible class that the facial movement, eyelid closure, and taste discrimination is affected by the trauma or chronic ear problem? So the answer for that is simple. It's because your facial nerve would traverse also above the oval window of your middle ear, okay, or your inner ear. Okay, so class, if you would notice, no, your facial nerve is also arising from these points here. That's why any problem no, on the ear could possibly also affect your facial movement, eyelid closure, and taste discrimination. So class, you will encounter patients wherein if they have chronic uh, otitis, their tendency is that when they close their eyes or even when they move their face, okay, they would have problems and say that it's painful. And then class, sometimes if you have ear problems, you would also be able not to taste properly the food that you are eating. And that is because part of your facial nerve is also going towards your ear. Let's proceed to your assessment. Okay, so class on the subjective data, of course, will be focused on your current health status, past health status, family history, occupational history, and lifestyle, and then your ROS review of systems. Let's talk about the common chief complaints that we can encounter from our patients with ear problems. One, hearing loss. Class for hearing loss, take note that there are two main types. I mentioned the third type, which is the mixed type. So class types, conductive hearing loss and sensory neural hearing loss. By now, recall that conductive hearing loss class occurs when there is problem on the outer ear and the middle ear. Sensory neural hearing loss class occurs when there is a problem on the inner ear. Now, initial signs and symptoms. Class, the usual initial sign that we can notice for a patient who is about to have complete hearing loss is this. Okay, their tendency to increase the volume of their television. And some of the people around will be saying that television is too loud, but for them it's not. Okay, class, they could not hear properly. That's a sign of hearing loss. What are the most common causes of your hearing loss? For the PIDS class, it is your serous otitis media. Otitis media, media, infection of your middle ear. For the adult class, it is your presbycusis. Class, in presbycusis, there is a tendency for the old adults not to hear high-pitched sounds. And this commonly occurs among men age 50. Class included on the high pitch sounds are the loud voices of women. Okay, so women who are shouting are considered to be high pitch sounds. So for that, men above 50 may have the tendency not to hear these voices. So you're pressed by cousis. Remember, pressed by it refers to your old adult changes. Then you have your pain. Class, the, the term for your ear pain is otalgia. So the most common cause for children is your otitis externa. So class, uh, there may be pain on the ear and the adjacent side. So as shown here, the pain could radiate up to here. Plus, because there is the same nerve supply for these structures. Okay, the common side also class of pain is that it may radiate also to your throat. Okay, if there is infection and then if there is presence of malignant tumors. Okay, or if there is presence class of infection on your throat, it may also class manifest as ear pain because of the commonality on the nerve supply. 
Then you have your tinnitus. Okay, we oftentimes say tinnitus, ringing of the ears. So class your tinnitus is the noise inside the ear. Class your tinnitus may vary from high pitch whistle to clanging of the bells. Okay, so why is tinnitus occurring? Your tinnitus could be because of the broken or damaged her hair cells in the cochlea. So class our cochlea would contain hair cells. Okay, so damage to this may manifest as tinnitus. Or the blood moves through nearby blood vessels, such as your carotid artery. So, class, if you would look at the structure of your ear, it is uh, just near your blood vessels. We have your carotid artery here, and then you have your internal jugular vein here. So, that's why sometimes it could manifest also as tinnitus, or problems with the joint of the jawbone, or how the ba brain processes the information. So, class, it may be a structural problem, or it may also be a perceptual problem. So, tinnitus would have a lot of um, indications. It may indicate class damage brought about by your uh, autotoxic medications. It may also indicate damage towards your brain. Now, class, you have your ear discharge or drainage. So, class, there are different types. You have your mucoid, your purulent, and then your bloody discharges. So, there are different causes for this. Okay, the most common cause is ostitis externa and media if there is already perforation. Okay, so again, your purulent discharge may be brought about by otitis externa or otitis media if there is already perforation of your tympanic membrane. Okay, just as a hint, once your tympanic membrane is already perforated, we need to avoid irrigation. Because if you will be irrigating a perforated tympanic membrane, it may cause okay, um, fluids going towards your middle ear, going towards your inner ear, which is not beneficial for those parts. Let's differentiate between the three types of discharges. Mucoid class, meaning there is irritation. There could be an excess in your ear discharge. Purulent will indicate presence of infection. In other words, uh, there is an underlying bacterial or fungal infection. So class, if it is an infection, okay, you would usually have your patient on otitis externa or otitis media. Bloody class, that would indicate the presence of trauma. Now, if there are clear discharges going towards your brain, Clear discharges going out of your ear, I mean, especially if your patient have had injury, you might need to suspect that your patient is having CSF leakage. Okay, so you need to do, do test for your halo sign to check if there is indeed presence of your CSF on the ear drainage. The next problem that we can have is the loss of balance. So plus your loss of balance is a problem also on pro proprioception. Meaning proprioception, recall, is the ability of our body to identify in what position are we on. Now, this done, the test for your balance is done using your Romberg's test. So when I do your Romberg's test class, what is being done is that the patient will be asked to remove his uh, footwear, that may be his shoes, and then she would need, need to stand with two feet together. The arms are either placed next to the body or crossed in front of the body. And then the clinician would ask the patient to stand straight with the eyes open for some time, let's say, for example, 10 seconds, and then late, uh, later on to close the eyes class for at least 10 seconds. What you're going to do if you're the nurse assessing the patient is that you need to check whether the patient is able to maintain the position class without losing balance or without shaking from side to side. If your patient class with eyes closed is shaking from side to side, that would indicate that your patient already have a problem on balance and equilibrium. So as a healthcare practitioner doing this assessment, what you can do is that you need to place your hands class uh, on the side of the patient, not touching the patient, but just be ready class to catch the patient in case the patient will fall. Okay, so be ready to catch your patient in case she will fall. So again, that's a test for balance and equilibrium. Next, you have your vertigo. So when I talk about vertigo, the usual complaint of our patient is the spinning sensation. This is a sign of damage or diseased vestibular system. There is usually an accompanying nausea and vomiting. And class, if our patient would be having nausea and vomiting, we have your anti-vertigo drugs. Example of your anti-vertigo drug is betahistine. If your patient class would have continuous nausea and vomiting, we may also administer your anti-emetics such as your metoclopramide. Okay, so these are the drugs used for vertigo management. Now, on the past history, you need to ask for the presence of injury abnormal sounds, infection, drainage, dizziness or vertigo, sinus infection, and then allergies or breathing difficulties for that matter. 
okay each of these problems here could also all attribute to your ear problems on the family history you need to ask if there is a problem hearing problem sinus problem and nasal problem class hearing problem has a tendency to have a familial predisposition whereas class for your sinus and your nasal problem it has a tendency to have environmental conditions associated to it so meaning class if one of the family members could have sinus or nasal problem it may be also possible that there is some concern on the environment that commonly leads to sinusitis and then your nasal problems Occupational history and lifestyle, so the loud environment, okay, that would include your printing press, okay, for that matter. Plus, if your patient is employed in this working environment, the tendency is that they're exposed to large, uh, to huge, loud sounds, which could possibly damage your ear. Okay, so um, construction sites, etc. Smoking class and consumption of your alcohol could also damage your ears. And then on the review of systems, you need to check for the following: no? the nose, the sinuses, the mouth the pharynx, the throat, history of trauma, head trauma, loss of balance, and then dizziness and vertigo. If any class of these problems are present, you would also suspect involvement of your ear. Okay? So, for example, class, if there is pharyngitis, if there is uh, acute tonsillopharyngitis, infection of your throat, infection of your tonsils, you might also suspect that there is a possibility for an ascending infection going towards your ear. Okay, uh, loss of balance and vertigo, as we have mentioned, is damage on inner ear. Head trauma, of course, plus leakage of your CSF or your autorea going towards your ear. On the succeeding discussion class or recorded lecture, we'll be talking about objective data and this further assessment of your ear. Once again, reminding you to laugh a little louder and dream a little bigger. Thank you for your attention.